All right, now just for fun, I will show you how we can replace a fully connected layer with a convolutional layer. And because it's so much fun, there are actually two ways of doing that. So we will have twice the fun. All right, let's start with the first one. So on the left hand side, I'm showing you for reference a fully connected layer that we have seen before. So in order to fit it onto the slide, this fully connected layer has exactly four inputs and two outputs. So yeah, you remember, of course, how we compute these, oh, right? So let's start with the green one. So here in green, all the connections in green, these are one weight vector, let's call that W1. And the output here is, yeah, the green dot. And we multiply the weight vector, of course, with the inputs here, the input X. And then we also have some bias unit. The bias unit is not shown, but it's, uh, Added, why not? So that would be added here. And yeah, this is how we compute the first output. So let's call that maybe output one. And then we have output two. And we compute it the same way, except now that we have these yellow connections, which is our W2. And actually, we can do the same thing, exactly the same computation using a convolutional layer. How does that work? So yeah, we would arrange our four inputs as an image, let's say as a two by two image here, right? And then we can have a, a we, let's focus on the green one now. We can have a kernel that has one input channel, a kernel with a one input channel and two by two kernel size and width. So the kernel is two by two with one input channel. And here, this would be our W1, the first kernel, let's say the green one here. All right, so this is one kernel. And the second kernel could be this W2 here, which is again, a kernel with one input size, or one input channel, sorry, and a two by two kernel size. And if you recall how we compute the convolution for, let's say, the receptive field here, this is our receptive field and this is here in green this is our oh sorry this is the output of course here in green this is our kernel so this one is essentially you can think of this operation essentially as um, um, similar to a dot product essentially if you you multiply those right it's a weighted weighted input and then you compute the sum so there's a sum over these and then you add the bias and it's exactly the same computation as this one and i will show you in the next slide with a code implementation that it gives you exactly the same results so in the grand scheme uh, grand big picture scheme here this would be a case where we would have a two kernels with one input channel and a kernel size of two by two all right, so it's maybe more complicated than it seems. So let's just take a look at a code example to maybe for those who prefer code examples to have another look at this. So here again, this is our fully connected um, setup. So I'm defining here my inputs. I'm just using some made up numbers, one, two, three, four. And I'm shaping them here such that they are shaped in this NCHW format that we usually use for convolutional networks. So we have one um, batch size of one, one input channel, height is two, width is two. Then I'm defining my fully connected layer here, four inputs, two outputs. Here are my weights. So on the previous slide, this would be our W1 here. So I can actually use the same colors maybe. So let me, because this was green, let me use the exact same colors. So this is green one. And this is the orange one. And the bias B2 is the yellow one. And here the green one, that's the B1. And now I'm just assigning them to the 
weight and bias in the fully connected layer here in the linear layer. Why am I doing that here? That is because when I call this function here, it will use random weights. And I want to compare this to a convolutional network. So in that way, I'm using fixed weights and a fixed bias unit just for yeah, just for showing you that I can do the same thing with a convolution network so that the numbers are not random here. Um, yeah, and then I'm calling here the fully connected layer on my inputs. I'm reshaping this to a long vector, of course. So I'm making, so this is a two by two, right? Here the two by two. I'm just reshaping it such that it's a long vector here with four units. And then you can see the results are 14.9 and 19. Now I can do the same thing here with my convolutional setup. So the kernel size I'm going to use is two by two because it's two by two here. And I'm just getting rid of the first dimensions here. This is all I'm doing because in the inputs here, I have it on the left hand side for reference. I'm just getting rid of these dimensions. So the first squeeze squeeze dimension zero, we'll get rid of the first one, so first dimension. And this one will get rid of the second dimension so that I have my two by two. I mean, these dimensions were empty, right? These were essentially just these square brackets. I'm essentially was just getting rid of these square brackets. Um, yeah, and then I'm initializing my convolutional layer here. One input channel, two output channels. So I have essentially two kernels and the kernel size is two by two. And here, just printing out the sizes. And here I'm assigning the weights that I had on the previous slide. So I'm assigning these weights here to my convolutional weights. Why am I doing that? It's not cheating or something. I'm just trying to use the same weights because when I initialize that, I will of course get random weights and I don't want to do this experiment with random weights because then it's hard to compare, right? So we have to use the same weights. So here I'm just using the same weights and the same bias. And then here I'm calling my convolution and you can see I get exactly the same results as with my fully connected layer, except of course the difference is that they are um, differently arranged because here we have um, channels with a fully connected layer. We don't have channels, inputs and output channels. So the dimension might look different, but the results are exactly the same. So this is one way you can replace a fully connected layer with a convolutional layer. Another way, this is the second way, would be to take these these fully connected, um, sorry, this vector here and stack it. So we stack it with four channels and then you can use four kernel, uh, sorry, two kernels with four channels each. So you have now still two kernels because we will have two output maps or yeah, two output feature maps. We can now use two kernels with for channels to implement the same as we have implemented here. Now going back here, I had two kernels with one channel each. Now I have two kernels with four channel each. The difference really is only that I have them stacked here, whereas here I have them arranged in this two by two fashion. Both ways would result in equivalent results compared to the fully connected layer. If you don't believe me, here's another example. So here I'm now having my convolution layer with four input channels, two output channels. So this is essentially the four channels, two kernels setup using my same weights so I can compare them and we will again get exactly the same results. So these are two different ways we can replace a fully connected layer with convolutional layers. So just revisiting our all convolutional network where we had this adaptive pooling. So we can now, for instance, instead of using adaptive pooling, could of course use a fully connected layer, but we could also use our new idea of just using a convolutional layer here. So to make this 
um, all convolutional network even more convolutional. So here, now I will set the kernel size to eight by eight because we found out in the previous code notebook that here at this stage, the feature maps will be eight by eight, or 64 by eight by eight. So uh, 64 is the channels, eight by eight is the height and width. So that's why I'm setting it to eight. And this, if you run this, it will give you exactly, or well, no, it will not give you exactly the same results as the adaptive pooling because now we have more parameters, but it will run it wide, even give you better results. Um, and yeah, here's last thing for this video. Here is a comparison, a direct comparison between the fully connected implementation of a network and the fully, uh, the fully convolutional version of that. So on the left hand side, I have here convolution 2D setup with 64 input channels and 64 output channels. And then I'm flattening it. So if these are 64 times eight times eight here, I'm flattening this so that this gets combined into the number of features. That's what I have here. It's a number of features. And then my output is the number of classes. So this is my last layer. So that's how we would usually do it. But if you have for some reason an aversion against fully connected layers, you could achieve the same thing using convolutional layers. By the way, I also tried that a few years ago just for fun um, with more serious networks. There's usually no, uh, no benefit. Um, I thought back in the day it might be easier for the implementation in CUDA to achieve better performance with that because you could probably leverage better parallelism with uh, multiple GPU cores. But in practice, I found almost zero difference whether we use fully connected or convolutional layers in the last layer. So this is here really what I'm showing you is really just more like a toy experiment or an example that we have the ability to do that to achieve the equivalent results, but it's not necessary. So you don't have to worry about that or you don't have to do that. I'm, I'm just like illustrating this here if you wanted to. I mean, it's more like, I think it, it could be technically be helpful to understand how convolutions work. But again, you can even think of this video as entirely optional. So here on the right hand side now, I'm showing you the equivalent implementation where I'm setting my convolution layer to 64 input channels. It's like before. And um, the output is the 64 classes. So here, this is really the number of classes. In the drawing here, we only had two classes, but let's say in Cypher 10, we would have 10 classes. All right, so that's what I'm um, setting it to. And this is uh, then here the 8 by 8 because we had 64 by 8 by 8 in the previous layer, or we're assuming that. And for this to work, this has to have the size of um, the feature map of the previous layer because we want to have a one, one by one output here. And you can run this and it will work. And it should give you equivalent results to the left-hand side implementation. If you try that in practice and you find that results might be slightly different, that might have something to do with a random weight initialization because every time you call a layer, it will create random weights. So this makes it hard to compare, but in theory, it should give you the same results because as we seen before, here, it's exactly yeah, producing the same results. Okay, so these were just some fun videos now, or not fun, but uh, I would say thought experiments, how we could technically get rid of non-convolutional layers if we have an aversion against fully connected or pooling layers. And in the next video, I will go back to a more important topic, transfer learning, which I think will be very useful for your class projects because it helps us leveraging related data sets.